so at the, uh, in my tender uh, preteen years, my mother had the occasion to remark to a friend of hers that she couldn't help but wonder if her youngest son was going to grow up uh, and end up in jail for pyromania or, or maybe be lucky and become a college professor. Um, and so far, I've avoided uh, jail for pyromania, but I do love fire. Um, through my teenage years, um, I continued to study a wide variety of ancient life ways, uh, so-called primitive technologies. Primitive not in a pejorative sense in my mind, but prime, first, original technologies. Um, things like flint napping, making Stone Age weapons, um, hunting with Stone Age weapons, um, traps and snares, wild edible foods, uh, making cordage out of natural fibers, uh, shelters, all kinds of fun stuff. I look back on, on that time of my life now and I realize that unbeknownst to me, I was training myself to become an experimental archaeologist, which is what I still do today, uh, as well as paleoanthropology. And I study the human origins of technology, uh, more specifically the human origins of fire. And interestingly enough, uh, at, although fire is, is one of the most important technologies for humans, um, there's no general consensus on when humans first started to use fire. But that's actually not the centerpiece of my talk. I, I, my, what I want to present today is, is something that's also very near and dear to my heart, and that's uh, my love of people, my love of, of humankind. I have always loved uh, watching people and studying people. I find humans endlessly fascinating, uh, often frustrating, sometimes vexing. Um, and one of the things I've noticed um, through the years of watching people is that, uh, that people are really good at classifying things, you know? People are really good at categorizing things. This is actually a sort of a fundamental aspect of, of science itself is that you can sort of break things down and examine the parts and then put it back together and maybe even study the, you know, the emergence, the, the phenomena of, of something being greater than the sum of its parts. But we're good at, at labeling things. Sometimes that's actually not so good. But um, one of the greatest labelers of science, of course, is Carl Linnaeus. And he gave us the idea of the bi binomial nomenclature. And so, um, so when, when uh, Linnaeus was, um, when Linnaeus was actually you know, coming up with this idea of binomial nomenclature, um, one of the things that, that often was important is that um, some quality, a uh, defining characteristic of, of the, the species will be used in the name. For example, a rundan area gigantea is um, the native North American river cane, and it's a giant type of cane, like a bamboo, a rundan area gigantea. But when, uh, when he came to naming us, uh, he didn't give a description. He actually wrote the phrase nosa to ipsum, which is know thyself, and called us homo sapiens. Uh, I have to admit that, that I kind of look around the world today and wonder a little bit about whether or not we exhibit a huge amount of wisdom. I'm not entirely sure that we actually have named ourselves correctly, right? I mean, there's uh, a lot of challenges and a lot of issues that, that our amazing technological powers have actually just brought to the forefront that really uh, put an exclamation point on, on it. So uh, I think one of the issues with, with understanding uh, why we humans sort of arrogate to ourselves this kind of godlike power on the earth that, that we have dominion over everything is not strictly from a religious point of view, but I think we have this tendency to see ourselves as more advanced, more evolved than other animals or, you know, other beings. And I think some of this goes back to uh, an ideology that was present even, you know, when when Linnaeus and Darwin and others were coming up with some very big ideas that have really moved science forward. This idea of the scala natura, where God is at the top, and then there are angels, and then there's humans, and animals and plants and non-living things. And you can imagine that in the humans, you know, they're also ranked under this system, right? So kings and queens are higher than commoners, but you could even look at it like, um, where are the Europeans? You know, where would be the Africans? Where would be the Native Americans? You see where I'm going with this. Not altogether good labels here. 
we would like to think that we have moved beyond this kind of thinking. Um, I would uh, suggest that you know, we haven't completely left it behind. And you can even see perhaps some you know, residue of this when you look at a phylogenetic tree of our own human lineage, right? Where there's this impression that humans, you see, are at the top. We're at the pinnacle. Uh, if I had you know, inverted this, it would maybe give a different impression, right? And so I think that we, we still struggle with these ideas. Um, so if, if, if wisdom... Actually, you know, homo sapiens, sapiens, wisdom. If wisdom isn't actually um, the most defining characteristic of humans, right, um, what are the defining characteristics of humans? Um, so quick audience interaction. Somebody start shout out a few things that you think define humans. Intellect, Intellect. socializing, language. emotions, language, bipedalism. Bipedalism, excellent. You will see, this is great. I, I was hoping that would happen. You never know, right? Um, they did t warn me that the clicker. There we go. So you can see that um, a lot of what you were shouting out actually are part of the characteristics that modern scientists that um, biological anthropologists use to define humans. But I want to bring your attention to this idea, you know, when you, when you look at bipedalism, when you look at broad apical tufts and the precision grip, when you look at specialized tendons for that precision grip, when you look at, at encephalization, uh, when, you, when you look at, you know, um, uh, burial and, and symbolic behavior and art, you see, what's the thread that kind of moves through all of those? It's really tool use and technology and the cultural curating of those technological systems that is interwoven with all these other aspects of what it means to be human. And so one might ask, um, you know, what are the foundational technologies of uh, of, of, of our human lineage. Um, when you think about what is technology, uh, you can go find uh, fairly clean, concise definitions. Merriam-Webster has a good one. But when you dig into what really makes technology, what is technology, what are the different kinds of technology, um, it's actually not so clear-cut. So myself and other primitive technologists, when we, when we teach about these ideas, we often use a, a simple mnemonic device uh, and we, we say that you can think about these original foundational technologies as, found, as uh, the three F's, all right? So there's fiber working, and there's flint working or stone working, and there's fire working. And so real quick, what I want to do is, is show you um, a, a, a quick demo of each of these. So um, fiber working is, is at the core of a lot of our modern technologies, including the clothes that we're all wearing. Um, but if you take some fiber like that tree bark, you know, in its, um, in its unmodified form, it actually is, is rather weak, right? So how do you solve that situation? So our ancestors, no one knows when we actually figured out how to do this. We, we have a hard time finding organic material in the archaeological record. It tends to rot. But you can actually take these kinds of fibers, and if you twist them independently, notice that I've, I've gathered, oh, I'm holding it in the middle, so I've got two, two limbs or two arms, of the fiber, and then I hold one, pinch that there's still, it's there's tension there, and so then I spin the other one, and I twist and switch, twist and switch, twist and switch, twist and switch. I'm not just twisting them together, I'm twisting them independently. I'm compressing the fibers, which increases the tensile strength, right? You can learn to do this on your leg, and, and it'll go faster. Um, and so by, by learning to, to ameliorate the weaknesses, in natural fibers and compress the fibers, then our ancestors figured out ways to make incredibly uh, strong material. You can actually uh, switch and, and go ambidextrous. If you, if you don't switch the, the direction of it, then of course you're only unwrapping it. Um, and so if you, if you switch it back and forth, you can, you can add length and you can keep plying and you can go as long as you want. You can make the rope as long as you want or as, as thick as you want. But in the end, it's so much stronger that you can't, you can't break it. Hold that in your mind about what is going on in the human brain that we think about that kind of, of technology. Hold that. So the second thing I want to talk about is, is the flint working. Now, I'm going to admit that I'm taking some liberty um, in, in presenting because we, you know, we go fairly quickly here. But... Um, when I say flint, I'm actually not meaning only flint. Um, it's just a mnemonic. 
there are lots and lots of different kinds of material that humans have used throughout our prehistory to make sharp-edged stone tools. But the one thing that most of them all have in common is that they're very silicious. They have a high silica content. Now, silicon in its pure state is actually kind of rare in nature. It's much more common for silicon to bond with, with oxygen, like SiO2, silica dioxide, which is sand, right, and in a lot of rocks. And so um, what's interesting about highly silicious rocks is that, I'm trying not to make a mess here, right, um, if, if it has a, a nice high content of, of silica in it, then it has certain qualities. It's going to be elastic and brittle, isotropic and microcrystalline or cryptocrystalline which means you can't really see the crystal structure. It's, it's hidden from the eye. But because of these characteristics, you can introduce energy into the rock matrix. I'm going to do this. You can predictably break the rock and store some of that energy in the form of a sharp edge and reuse it over and over and over and over, which is pretty clever. This is the unsung hero of all stone tools. It's not the fancy spear points. Those are lovely. But the stone flake tool for butchery is virtually unsurpassed. So hold that in your mind as well. Um, so the third... Fire making, the part um, that you've all been waiting for, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, let's see if we can. Let's see if we can do this without setting off the fire alarm, right? <laughs> Y'all are thinking, is he is he serious? Is he is he really going to do that? Um, <laughs> okay, so. So one of my students earlier said, are you nervous? I said, have you ever, ever made fire in, in front of a couple of hundred people on camera? Of course I'm a little nervous. So our ancestors would not talk about this in the way that I'm about to talk to you, but I suspect that when our ancestors learned how to make a fire, which is probably the third horizon, right, of fire control. The first was scavenging a wildfire. The second horizon was learning to keep it going. And then, and then the uh, third horizon would have been the ability to manufacture fire at will. And again, we have no idea when this happened. But they wouldn't have said that the magic, the mystery of this is really... Fundamentally, electricity. Electricity is a fundamental property of all matter. And if you can get your heat and your fuel and your oxygen to the right mix, then you can convince an ion to phase shift and release a particle of its mass as energy. Right? Now, why is all this important? If you think about what we've done with silicon and what we've done with networks and what we've done with electricity, you can begin to understand that there is something fundamental about the way humans think that is really what sets us apart, and it's technological thinking. We are the technological ape. We have done what no other animals have done, though there are a lot of other animals that use tools. We synthesize different substrates, different media into amazing, complicated, beautiful conflagrations of technology. Let's see if we can get a flame here. I, I did have water just in case it got out of hand. So, 
So here at, at, at the end, as I, as I come to a, kind of the close of, of my presentation, it would, it would be remiss of me not to mention that, that although I've been talking about homo technologensis for 20 years or more, I'm not like the stepchild of anthropology. You know, I'm not the one way out in left field. Um, my colleague and friend Dietrich Stout, who's one of Emory's own, uh, I was very pleased a couple of years ago, and I'm sure that he didn't get the idea from me. I think it came to him on his own, that he had written in a popular piece in Scientific American that, uh, that he felt that maybe we had misnamed ourselves, that maybe Homo sapiens wasn't the best, that maybe Homo artifacts would have been better. Well, you can see that's quite similar to my ideas. I think fundamentally part of what we're trying to get at is that in this day and age when technologies are advancing so fast, when there are people who are so wealthy and so powerful who have a clear stated goal that humans leave this planet, that we colonize other worlds, I think that that what I would like to see us do first is to account for our power, be responsible for our actions, learn to live sustainably, engage with the truth of our lineage, of our, of our legacy as homo technologensis, because as that saying goes, with great power comes great responsibility. Are we showing the kind of responsibility that would make us good neighbors to some other species out there, right? Because as Carl Sagan said, if we're the only ones in this cosmos, what a terrible waste of space, <laughs> right? Homo technologensis. I think that if we embrace that idea, if we understand the power in our technology, that we may give ourselves the chance to one day grow up and become homo sapiens. Thank you.